because of Jesus, I have a new beginning, a new identity, and a new reality. Jesus, for who he is, and for what he has done for me, should affect my life, my relationships, my emotions, and how I live my everyday life. Jesus changes everything. Good morning. So glad that you are here with us this morning. Oh, for many years I was a a youth pastor and I had a teenager who who, um, had the privilege of leading him to Jesus in this church a number of years ago. And he he was so passionate about law enforcement. I mean, he ate it, drank it, slept it. In fact, when we would go on certain ministry trips, um, he would bring his police scanner on the trip. And when it's at nighttime where, you know, all the guys need, in their area need to go to sleep, all the girls in their area go to sleep, well, I walk through and I hear this police scanner, and, you know, because Corey wanted to listen to the 911 calls. I mean, he was that into it, and his goal, his hope, his dream would one day he would have that as his career. And years later, I got the call, he was accepted into the police academy. I mean, he was just so excited, so excited. And so then he, was, he would tell me, I would almost get play by play every week of what he was learning at the academy. The first part of his training was in the classroom training. In the classroom training. You know, sit down, take notes. You got to learn the information. You got to understand the facts. You got to learn the laws. You got to understand the, the you know, law enforcement, you know, uh, philosophy and theories and, and, and make sure that you have the right procedures and this is the paperwork and all that stuff. And he was like a sponge, like, this was awesome. And I'm thinking, this is boring. <laughs> but he would just, he loved it. And then he went out of the classroom and the in the field training. And he was, I mean, he was even more excited. He was absolutely more excited because he got to go to the firing range. He had to learn hand-to-hand combat and he had to, to, to go like high speed, you know, uh, you know, had to chase somebody and, and all the driving skills that went with that. And he was just like, this is awesome. And then he said that the hand-to-hand combat, because he loved the, you know, the shooting range, but the hand-to-hand combat, here's this tall, skinny dude thrown into a, an, a, an arena, and a 350-pound Samoan instructor knocked the snot out of him, <laughs> right? Because he had to learn what to do, what not to do, how to position yourself, what, when to call for backup, all that sort of stuff. And then he said he was in the car with the trainer, and the trainer said, I want you to go 80 miles an hour. Just slam it. So he was like, yeah! And then he's at 80 miles an hour. The instructor said, slam on the brakes and turn. He said it scared him to death. But it was awesome! You know, it was awesome. See, there's two types. In the classroom training and in the field training, both are important. Both are important. If you're new with us, uh, we, we, we are in this book series, this little letter of Colossians. And we have, are finishing up, have finished up the in the class training of knowing Jesus, all about who is Jesus and what he has done for us. So many misconceptions, myth about Jesus, who he is and what he's done. And we talked about he is the image of the invisible God. I mean, he is God in the bod, and he is the creator and the sustainer and the highest influencer, and he's our peacemaker. And all these things we learn, who is Jesus? And then we unpacked what has he done for us? He has rescued us if we trust in him, rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He has brought redemption to us. He paid for our, our sin on the cross. He, he gave us forgiveness of all of our sins, past, present, and future. He has, as we talked about last week, he has set us free from the bondage of our sin nature. And so many things of not only who he is and what he's done, and this is important It's hard to live the life of faith without the instruction and the information and the truth. But now we are in the second half of this study of this little book. And now it's not knowing Christ, now it's living for Jesus Christ. So that's the shift today, living for Jesus Christ. And now now it's transitioning from theology to reality. From in the classroom to in the field. 
And today is going to start like, whoa, this is awesome. And then it's going to be a shift of cold water thrown in our face to emphasize how important it is and how and why we should live for Jesus. Why we should live for Jesus. If you uh, have a copy of God's Word, turn to Colossians chapter 3, if you would. Maybe a tablet, maybe on your phone. Uh, There's Bibles in the back. But if you don't have one, uh, I'm going to put the part that I read, the seven verses that I read, we'll put them on the screen so that you can stay with us, stay engaged with us. But before we dive into chapter 3, uh, we need to give a perspective. This is super important as we dive into what Jesus wants us to do with our faith. Here's, here's, here's the difference, though. Religion is all about the do. Biblical Christianity is all about what was, has been done. It, religion is like, I got to do this. I got I to do this to please God, to earn his favor, to earn his forgiveness. I got to do this and do that and do this and do this. And biblical Christianity is, no, let's just focus on what Jesus did on the cross. It's done. If we are kind of in this mode of, of religion, it's more that I, I got to do this just in case. That's my reality. A just in case reality where biblical Christianity is, it is, a, it is finished reality. It is finished reality. Big difference. Especially as we unpack, this is how we are to live with Jesus. It's not to do these things to gain God's favor. It's because of what he's done for us. That's why we we do these things. Now, there's a a, a boy and a girl, same street, different homes, but on the same street, they were told each by their father, I'm going to work today, the lawn needs to be mowed, I need you to mow the lawn. Now, the boy had a father that was difficult. Father that was, in his estimation, always mad at me. He was always mad at me. I can never get it right. I can never do enough. And he mowed the lawn with this as a filter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best because maybe this time he'll notice that I did a good job. And maybe this time I will win his approval. So he was focused on mowing the lawn for the approval of his father. The little girl, however, had a loving father who loved her and cared for her and accepted her and adored her and provided for her. And she had a whole different approach to mowing her lawn. She did it with an excitement. She did it because I love my dad. I I want to honor my dad. And I'm going to do the very best job that I can for my father. Here's the difference. The boy did something to appease his father. The girl did something to please her father. See, biblical Christianity is not what is portrayed around our culture and our world. It is vastly different than religion. I've got to do to appease God. So as we go down this path, some of us can be like, yes, this is awesome. Other times in the field training, it's going to be, oh, oh, this is hard. Remember why. Because of who Jesus is and what he has done. We do these things to please him, not to appease him. Do these things to, pe- uh, not to please him, not to appease him. So we begin in chapter 3, and we, and we left off yesterday, as, I mean last Sunday, of an illustration of, of what Jesus did for us. And he gave us two examples, two pictures. And one of the pictures I'm not going to talk about, and I won't talk about that topic for at least three years. If you watch online, you don't understand what I'm talking about. The other picture was that when we trust in Jesus, it's like a picture of a baptism that we, uh, all, all of our life and our past and our guilt and our shame has been buried with Jesus. And then we are raised in newness with Christ, new life with Christ, new hope for Christ, new future with Christ. That's where he leads off in chapter 3, verse 1. It says, since then... You have been raised with Christ when you trusted in him as your savior. You've been raised with Christ. He says this, now set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears... Then you will also will appear with him in glory, in glory. 
if you're taking notes today, here's a central point. And this was printed, your programs were printed before the, the snow or during the snow, so there's no underlines. So you got to write fast and think fast. Central point, a vertical reality gives my daily life a reality check. You're going to see that today. A vertical reality, that's what he's starting with. If we have that, it will give my daily life a reality check. It's one thing to be in the classroom, to gain knowledge about who Jesus is, what he has done. That's in the classroom. That's important. But it's a whole different deal in our daily life, in the field, with people that know us, live with us, work with us, are acquainted with us. It's a big difference. But if we have a vertical life, Got to understand it's going to affect our daily life with a constant, almost a daily basis, a reality check of living for Christ. Now, what he says, what he says here, let me unpack this. He says, set your hearts on things above. The heart in the Greek means this, our cravings, our desiring, seeking in order to find. I mean, that's that earnest search. We're determined. We're putting our whole heart into something. That's where that phrase comes from. That's what it means that sets your hearts on things above, crave things above, seek, desire, be passionate about it on things above, not on earth, earthly things. It says not only set your hearts on things above, it says set your minds on things above. That's what we think about, give attention to, dwell on, focus on. In the King James Version, it says set your affections all right, that's, that's what drives us. That's what moves us. That's the passionate search. I mean, you're thinking about it all the time. And then he says this, and I'll unpack this as a really interesting definition, on things above, not on earthly things. Now, when you unpack this word in the Greek, very descriptive, it means to unfasten, to unloosen. It's like, that sounds weird. Now, think about it. He's saying, set your hearts and your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Meaning, if we're going to do this, if we're going to have a vertical reality, we have to unbuckle, unloosen, unfasten what we know, all that we know and experience, and it's called this world, this earth. We can't fully have a vertical reality if we're tied to strapped to, buckled to, just earthly things. Now, let me give you a couple examples of the, this principle we, we do all the time. You've, you've done this before in your life. Some of you maybe are here right now. See, when we're, some of you have to go way back to think about this and remember this. Some of this is really fresh. When you're in love, like, you found the girl, you know, he's the guy. You may be at school, you may be at work, but you're unloosened, you're unbuckled, because your heart and your mind is, I can't wait to see her again. I can't wait to see him again. I can't wait to after school or at lunch break or, or after work, I can't wait to, to talk to them, I can't wait to call them again. You may check, be checking off the boxes, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do in my classroom, you know, or, or at work. But I'm not all there, because I'm in love. Whoo, right? I'm in love. Some of you are like, I'm, I, feel, I feel in love for the first time. I like, describe that feeling. Well, it's, the, my stomach is just, and I'm like, I've told teenagers, that could be gas. <laughs> you never know. Got to check. But when you're in love for the first time, aren't we distracted Aren't we, I would much rather be with them because I'm, I'm thinking about them I, I, all the time. That's where my affections are. And that's what Paul is saying. Put your, place your heart and your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Another way we, we live this out is when we're counting down the days of a trip we're about to take. And my wife and I are fully here. We're fully here. We're here, but not here. Because in a few weeks, we're going to do what we started three years ago, a, a new tradition called Empty Nest Tradition, is uh, in March, we go to Arizona. 
palm trees, heat, <laughs> baseball games, heat. <laughs> See my brother, heat, <laughs> baseball games. All right, so we're here, but we're counting down the days because we're so looking forward to that, especially after all this snow and it's been freezing. This California boy is hurting. See how we can get so distracted with things? I and mean, We're here, but really our hearts and our minds are unloosened, unbuckled because we can't wait to be there. And that's what Paul is saying. Since you have been raised with Christ, you got a brand new life, you got a brand new hope, you got a brand new future, then set your mind, set your hearts on things above. Unbuck yourself from this earth. And what happens, what it will do, well, it will, a vertical reality will impact our daily life and give us constant reality checks, constant opportunities to refocus, to re-engage on what's important. And what happens is that it will, this daily reality check will offer questions that we need to answer and wrestle with. Here's, here's the first question. It's this, is what is really important? Not seriously, what is really important? See, if we have a vertical reality, we're gonna answer that completely different than we just have an earthly reality. We, we live in a culture that's all about consuming. Billion, 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 billion dollar in industry of advertisements, right? We just got through that with the holidays and you need this, you want this, you have to have this. Everybody has it but you. And it's important. But a vertical reality helps us to focus, go, you know, everything I've purchased, everything I want to purchase, one day will eventually break and eventually burn. If my hope is in heaven, that, that all changes. I'm not saying no, don't purchase things, all right? I'm not saying not have nice things, not enjoy the, the gifts that God has, has blessed, blessed you with, but is that really the most important thing in your life? A vertical reality will help us have a different reality check. A second question is this, is whose opinion really matters? With a vertical reality, we, we approach that completely different. Whose opinion really matters? Because we live in a culture where it's all about what people think of us. And we gotta look good. And no, 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 you can't use that picture on Instagram, I don't look good. My hair's not just perfect, all right? Or, or, you know, everybody else is perfect, but then, no, 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 I can't use that because i got to look good. I, I gotta, I've got to post on social media that everything in my life is awesome when it's not all the time. And we're all about our image and people's opinions. The Bible says that the fear of man, that's being so consumed with what, what people think, your friends think, your other people think, your coworkers think, that's the fear of man. He says the fear of man is a snare. It's a trap. It's bondage. But if you have a vertical reality, it's not like you just do whatever you want to say and do and say whatever because you don't care what people think. That, that's, not, that's not wise. That could be foolish. But it's not, I'm not a slave to the opinions of other people. A vertical reality says this, I'm more concerned in what Jesus thinks of me than what anybody else thinks of me. And we walk into, and, and don't, don't just put peer pressure on teenagers. It's, it's called all human beings. We can be enslaved by what people think. A vertical reality, my heart and mine are things above. I'm more concerned about what Jesus thinks of what any person thinks. The other question that will help us with a reality check is this, is what will really last over time? Like, Really? last. That's where I spend my time, my energy, and my money. Where do I spend my time, my energy, and money? I'm in, I take all that, I'm investing my time, money, and energy into things, into people, into programs, into, I mean, some of them are good things. Some of them are a waste of our time, energy, but we just do it because we like it. But what will really last over time? It doesn't mean I shouldn't care about my career. It doesn't mean I shouldn't care about, you know, this, you know, where, where my money's going for this investment. I'm not saying that. 
But a, a vertical reality helps me really focus on what's really important and what, what is really going to last. Here's what Jesus said about that. He says, do not store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal them. I hate that when someone steals something from me. He goes on to say this, store up treasures, however, store up treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. I mean, this is a principle we all know. Where we're investing our time, energy, and money is what we think is really important. So what is really going to last? Jesus says, if you pay it forward for my kingdom, that will last. Anything about your kingdom will not last forever. Will not last forever forever. I came across a phrase that I didn't capture who said it, but it was so important. I wrote it down in my notes weeks ago. I don't want to bring it up here. It's so true. This person said this, when our hearts are not directed heavenward, we drift throughout life aimless, discontent, and unfulfilled. This is brilliant. This is true. When our life and our hearts are not directed heavenward, we drift through life aimless, discontent, and unfulfilled. You can even throw in super busy in this. But just think about the opposite. If our hearts and our minds are directed heavenward, we will not drift through life. We'll have a life that's filled with purpose, contentment, and fulfillment. Purpose, contentment, and fulfillment. I think of some of the amazing people that God has brought, and he's brought a lot to Grace Point. Highly successful outside these walls. But where they get the most satisfaction and fulfillment is pouring themselves into our teenagers here. Pouring themselves for our kids here being successful out there so that they go on short-term mission trips. See, everything changes where our hearts and our minds are focused on. I jumped ahead for two services in a row. I'm going to go back to a passage that he talks about. He says this about why should we, this is really the answer, why should we place our hearts and minds on things above? He says for, meaning because, your life is now hidden in Christ. Christ, I love this phrase, who is your life, he goes on to say. Are, are, now that you've been raised with Christ, you should set your hearts on and things above, your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Why? Because your life is now hidden in Christ. In fact, Christ is your life. That, that is the, the, the beautiful picture of being, being so attached to Christ because, because I've been buried with Christ. My past, my sins, my shame, my guilt. Now I've been raised in newness of life. I'm alive now. I have a new hope, new life, new future. Now everything I do revolves around Christ. I'm hidden in Christ. He is my life. And my old way of thinking that it's my dreams, my hopes, my desires, and my hands on the wheel of my life, that's done. Now it's, okay, God, what dreams do you have for me? What desires should I have from you? And Jesus, you take the wheel of my life. I'm in the back seat, not in the you know, passenger seat because I'll reach over and grab the wheel because we've grown up and <laughs> that's been our habit. My, my old life is over, the way I approached it, the way I thought about it. And now, my life is not all about me, myself, and I, and that's my orbit. And everybody else, I will be happy if everybody is orbiting their life around me, myself, and I. No, 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 my life is hidden in Christ. He is my life. My life, my hopes, my dreams are now orbiting around Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. You see, what we've learned so far in the classroom, if you were here, and you can watch all of those previous online if you, if you want to, that the supremacy of Christ means something. He outranks every power, every authority, every status, 
And it's talked about how he deserves, and he won't force his way, he deserves first place, preeminence in our life. The supremacy of Christ. Then we talked about all sufficiency of Christ. Everything we need is found in him. Everything in life we need at our core is found in Jesus. You put those two together with we have been set free from our sin nature. See, Jesus is not just something we tag on to our story of our life. We just would add Jesus to our story. No, Jesus is now our story of our life. He's everything to us. And that's the challenge that many believers have. They've just checked the box, I've trusted in Jesus, and I go to church, and sometimes I worship, sometimes I read his Bible, sometimes I come here, but Jesus isn't really our life, and we're like, hmm, why is my life aimless? Why is my life not fulfilled? Why am I not content? Because your focus, your heart, mind, affections are just on the temporary. You don't have a vertical reality. Jesus saved you. He he has an inheritance waiting for you in heaven, but this life is just not satisfying. Well, it can be if you reorient your life that Jesus is your story. And as we unpack the practical ways to live for Jesus, if you just, like, Jesus really is my life, and I am really all about him, it will change your emotions, it will change your relationships, it will change your marriage, it will change your parenting, it will change the way you approach money and your job and your pay. And it will change it all for the better. But there's got to be some changes. Reorientate so that I have a vertical reality. It's all about focusing on Jesus. Now, the next few verses I'm going to read is that cold water thrown in our face. All what I talked about, oh, that's awesome. Okay, let's just start with the hardest thing right off the bat. To really live for Jesus and have a vertical reality. Verse five, just said all this. Verse five, put to death, therefore, okay, there's the water right there. Here's the screeching of the brakes. We're making a hard right turn. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And what does that mean? Put to death sexual immorality. Put to death impurity. Put to death lust. Put to death evil desires. Put to death greed, which is idolatry. The first thing we're told to tackle, not to appease God, but to please God, is sexual sin that's in and all around us. He said that, but he mentioned greed. I don't think he's talking about money there. The the, the definition of greed in the Greek means in Satiable desire to have more. And the word idolatry means anything, anything more important than God. Cold water, right in our face. Have a vertical reality right off the bat, then put to death sexual sins in your life. That you may not think anybody knows, but your Heavenly Father has seen it all. He knows what you're involved with. Now, here's a statement that is hard but extremely true. If you've been walking with Jesus for any length of time and you've been around, you've heard stories, heard the bad news that seems to be surfacing more and more, you'll know that this is true. Nothing more undermines a Christ follower's faith story than sexual sins. This is a harsh reality but if, if we didn't care about you, God, God, God doesn't care about you, he wouldn't mention it. I wouldn't mention it. Nothing more undermines a Christ follower's faith story than sexual sins. Why? Because when we're involved in sexual sins, maybe parents know or a spouse knows, maybe no one knows but God. When we're involved in sexual sins, 
it greatly affects our walk with Christ, our worship of Christ, and our witness for Christ. It absolutely just unplugs the power in those three areas. It's hard to walk with Jesus when on the side we're in immorality and impurity and lust and got all these evil desires and we have a insatiable desire for more and we have placed that above Jesus himself. It's hard to walk with Jesus. In fact, we hide from Jesus. Just all the way back, back in the Garden of Eden. In their nakedness, they were shamed and they hid from God. And then we throw out excuses. Oh, I just don't like church anymore. I don't like youth care anymore. Uh, you know, all those Christians are just, you know, they're judgmental. You're fighting against God and you will lose that fight. It affects our walk with Jesus. It affects our worship of Jesus. Why isn't worship so passionate and expressive in churches? Because I believe a lot of this is going on. And why do we miss church on a more regular basis? Some of this stuff's going on. The last thing we want to do is be exposed to the light when we know we're living in darkness. And we'll divert and point, point fingers everywhere. And Jesus is like, I know what you're doing. I'm in the room with you when you're doing it. I see what you're clicking on. I see what you're watching on your phone. I see what you're doing with that person. And you know it's wrong. And I know it's wrong. So it greatly impacts our walk with Jesus, our worship of Jesus, and our witness for Jesus. So if we're going to put to death these things, it doesn't say, um, you know, just, just remove them from your life. That, that's actually a little bit we're going to talk about next Sunday. Like, you know, just remove them. But no, this is like put to death. This, there's no gray area here. There's, no, there, there's nothing gray area. All right, when it comes to sexual sins, the Bible says two things about it. Run from it or kill it. And sometimes do both at the same time. In my experience, the only way sexual sins die in the life of a follower of Jesus is if starvation happens. You can't like, oh, I'll just, you know, I'll just reduce my intake of that. No, no, no. Complete starvation will cause death. And it takes some time. And it's hard because it has attached itself to our hearts and our minds and our relationships. Here's some practical examples. I'm, well, before I said I'm so glad I'm not the Holy Spirit that I, I don't know everything that's going on in your lives. If I would know 20% of what's really going on in our church, I would resign today. I couldn't handle it. And I've realized over the years I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm horrible when I try to be the Holy Spirit, try to guilt people. I, 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 that's, there's no power there. And there's no, there's no real change there when someone tries to guilt you. But there is probably someone in this audience or watching online right now that you're involved in an inappropriate relationship and you think you're faking everybody out. And you may think uh, fake people out, but you're not faking God out. And that relationship needs to end today completely. You've got to put to death an inappropriate sexual relationship. Some of you, you haven't crossed a line, but you're flirting with it. And you will cross that line, and the excuse of what just happened is a lie. You've been getting closer to that line, inch by inch, day by day. With our entertainment at home, we turn on the television, and some of you choose to have channels that just pour in sexual wickedness into your house, goes through your eye gate, goes through your ear gate, it affects your heart. I'm trying to be practical. Some of you need to cancel some premium channels. Some of you need to call your cable company today and say these channel, channels that have MA, mature audiences only, stuff that's coming to my house, cancel it, block them. 
I still remember having a long, con- a five-minute conversation with DirecTV years ago because that late at night I'm flipping through and they were, oh, this is the three-month free. And I'm, my eyes were like, oh, my flesh was like, more, more, more. Come on. Every pastor, every person in ministry, we're guilty of sin and open to temptation like everybody else. So I called them up and said, remove those channels, block them. Yeah, but you don't understand, you're saving money. I don't care about the money. Well, for three more months, it's just, I ended up yelling. Cancel them. I don't want them in my eyes. I don't want to see them. And it made no sense to the dude on the phone. They're free. (laughs) Like, no, they're very expensive. They're very expensive. So some of you need to do that. Some of you, the best thing you can do in 2019 is just, it's just like, this is crazy, okay? Is to cancel cable completely. But then I know what some of you are thinking. But I can still get it on my computer or my phone. The heart is wicked, desperately wicked. And you need to install covenant eyes on your computer and your phone. Covenant eyes goes based upon Job, says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to lust after a female. Well, you can say it all you want, but covenant eyes, um, you sign up for that and you find somebody that you respect, that you, you trust, and then Every week, they get a report of where you've been on your computer and your phone. See, a lot of us are dumb, but we're not stupid. See, we're dumb. Oh, I can't believe I did that, but we're stupid. We're not stupid to like, if we know that someone important in our life is going to know where we've gone, guess what? We won't go. I'm not clicking on that, baby, because I don't want him to know. I don't want her to know. See, we may be dumb, but we're all not stupid. Guess what sin makes us? Very stupid. I've said this for many, many years. With little to no accountability leads to incredible stupidity. Little to no accountability leads to incredible stupidity. Some of you are like, I don't watch that stuff. But you read it. They said, well, it's romance novels, but they're going into such description of clothes flying off and bodies coming together. Your, your mind is watching it, and it's it making an indelible imprint. Put to death. Starve it. Starve it. And in verse 7, it says, you used to walk in these ways. In the life you once lived. But <laughs> You've, you've been buried with Christ, but now you have a new life in Christ. So live like it. Live like it. Romans chapter 6, it says this in the same way. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let, it's a choice. Do not let sin reign, rule, be in control in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. The illustration last week with the sin, the sin nature being wrapped up, our volunteers, kind of volunteers, um, wrapped up with the sin nature, but we have been cut. We have been set apart from our sin nature, but we go back to it and wrap ourselves in bondage based on sin. It goes on to say this, do not offer, meaning that's a choice. Do not offer parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. That's, you know, that's, that's the word of God. Let's get more specific. Do not offer your brain, your eyes, your mouth, your hands, your intimate parts, body parts. Do not offer those parts to sin as instruments of wickedness. Rather, offer your mind and your eyes and your mouth and your hands and the intimate parts of your body to God as instruments of righteousness, right living. I'm I'm, going to tell you this. It makes no sense to those who don't have Jesus. I'm like, that is so unfun. Unf- that's just, that just doesn't sound like fun. 
Our Heavenly Father doesn't tell this because he's trying to be mean to us. That is one of the most loving things our Heavenly Father says to us because he knows how intimate sexual temptation and sins are and the damage that it will do for decades and decades. And you can be healed and rescued from it because of Christ and only because of Christ. Why waste years and why carry around regret? Because you can't undo certain things. It's very loving. So a vertical reality, our hearts and minds on things above will show up in daily life. And he starts off with, you know, to change how we think about what's life, what's important, opinions. But he starts off with, well, where's the direction of my affections? Are they in the direction of God or are they in inappropriate directions? And if they are, put to death those things. You can't walk with Jesus, worship Jesus, and, and be a witness to Jesus if you've got this junk going on in your life. And once you cut that off, put to death, you will experience life and freedom like you haven't experienced ever or in a long time. And you can live your life with joy and purity and peace and power that you're not living with today. So I close with something very practical. Very practical. Got to make a vow. You got to follow through with it that I should not or I will not watch, read, click, or touch Anything that will not direct my affections toward Christ or toward my spouse. If you're not married yet, it's your future spouse. That I will not watch, read, click, or touch anything that will not direct my affections toward Christ or toward my spouse. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, this is, this is a challenging passage we went through today. First part was easy. The second part got real. Maybe got painful. But Jesus, if you have saved us, our life is now hidden in you and you are our life. Our story should all revolve around you. God, I pray that you would take your word, your truth, I didn't write this, your truth, and impact the hearts of those who listened in, in person or online today and 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 you're saying, please make changes, I have a much better, much more enjoyable future for you, but you have got to put to death certain things to, starting today. Lord, I pray that you take your truth and, and, and fill people with power to obey you. And God, may they experience you and taste you like never before because they change their reality to a vertical one, not an earthly one. God, I can't make those changes. I, I'm desperate for you in my own life to keep this, keep it vertical and keep pure. I'm, I'm, I'm in a battle every day. Oh, I pray that you give great victory for those who heard from you today. Help us as we move forward in other practical daily aspects of life to live for Jesus that makes a difference. Pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we say Yes. Amen.